Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring science and the cities or powers associated with yoga. With me is Dr. Dean Radin, who is the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences in Petaluma, California. He is author of The Conscious Universe, The Scientific Truth of Psychic Phenomena, Entangled Minds, Extrasensory Experiences in a Quantum Reality, Real Magic, Ancient Wisdom, Modern Science, and a Guide to the Secret Power of the Universe, and Supernormal, Science, Yoga, and the Evidence for Extraordinary Psychic Abilities. This is an internet interview, and now I will switch over to the internet video. Well, welcome, Dean. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. We'll be talking about yoga and the cities uh, today. And I suppose a very good place to start, and you go into depth about it in your book, would be the Yoga Sutras, which is considered, I think, by most people to be the primary source text of the yoga tradition. At least uh, of classical yoga, yes. Mm Mm-hmm. And you write that it's really uh, divided into four different sections. So the, the four little books, uh, the sutras are uh, evoke the image of a thread mm-hmm. and the way that Patanjali wrote back then, probably because paper was expensive, uh, was to, to write the entire book in terms of essentially one paragraph sentences. Mm-hmm. And that's how each book, each of the books is written. So this is both good because it's pithy, but it's also challenging because it means that there, there could be many ways of interpreting the, these different threads. And mm-hmm. so there have been thousands of commentaries written since the original uh, uh, Yoga Sutras. But the, the essence of the books were first to talk about the nature of yoga. Uh, and primarily at that time, yoga was really about meditation. Mm-hmm. The, the only reason that the physical portion of yoga came about as well as the uh, the training, the ethical training, was to get your body strong enough so that it could it, you could sit and meditate for eight to ten hours a day. And the ethical part was to get your ego out of the way because it was recognized that uh, this would get in the way of the goal of yoga and meditation, which was transcendence or enlightenment. So one of the books talks about samadhi which is about this deep state of meditation. Another one, which is the one that I focused on, is uh, the third book, which talks about the cities, Mm. which essentially is a yardstick that is useful for the meditator to recognize that uh, if you start encountering things like what we would call telepathy or clairvoyance, that these are just natural consequences of deep meditation. And that if you... In, in these deep meditative states, if you do a particular kind of practice called samyama, that you can develop these abilities. And all of them are basically revolving around the idea that if, because uh, the state of samadhi, this deep meditative or absorptive absorption state, in that state, if you identify with a concept or an object or a person, you become that. So telepathy occurs because you, in this unity state, you become your friend. Well, you are your friend at that point. But you actually know more about them than they may know themselves because you know them consciously and unconsciously and their entire history and maybe even their future. So by the same token, if you you contemplate and be absorbed with the notion of gravity – well, then maybe you can become gravity and reverse yourself if you wish, and then you can start flying. So this is what the 25 or 26 different cities are described as. So you become this, and then you get this power. And then the, the last part of the book is talking about the goal, which is enlightenment. It's to get beyond the uh, the 
the bounds and sufferings of being human. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's intriguing that uh, the Yoga Sutras would spend about 25%, one of the four books of the Yoga Sutras, focusing on these powers, and at the same time saying, but don't pay much attention to them, they are a distraction. A distraction because, uh, like with any power, it's seductive. Mm -hmm. And so you become seduced by the power, and you become Darth Vader, and you forget that the goal was not the achievement of the powers, but the enlightenment, which mm -hmm. was the the reason for doing all of this work in the first place. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, this is this is specifically having to do with with Eastern philosophy. Eastern philosophy was largely pushed towards enlightenment mm -hmm. to, to get get rid of human frailties. Whereas, as I, I wrote in in Real Magic, from the Western perspective. The goal was development of these mm -hmm. powers. Mm -hmm. So culture defines what people think that they're interested in. And even in the Eastern culture, when somebody would develop the cities and, and demonstrate it, they immediately would get a huge following. Mm -hmm. This is still a problem today. All of the so-called godmen in India, the gurus, that, that become uh, very popular because they probably are able to demonstrate at least an elementary form of a city. The practice of Samyama is uh, particularly interesting to me because uh, in order to begin to practice Samyama, as I understand it, you have to already have achieved a state of Samadhi, which is considered uh, at least a, a degree of enlightenment. Yes. And, and so... Uh, it, you need to be able to get to, to samadhi and stay there for as long as you wish. Mm -hmm. And it's only in that state that you start to do some yama, and that's how you develop the, the, the cities. So I've, I've meditated on and off since 1970, when I first learned how to do the TM method. And I would say then that uh, with 40 plus years of doing various kinds of meditation, that the total amount of of time that I think I've actually dropped into samadhi, and it is kind of a, a it's a it's a distinct difference between what I normally experience as meditation. For me, meditation is and kind of empty my mind out of thoughts, and I feel very relaxed, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. But samadhi is very different, and and there uh, of out of forty years, I can count maybe five minutes mm -hmm. of spontaneously going into samadhi. But so I don't have enough time in it to develop the cities because it didn't happen at will and it wasn't there very long to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that if you're trained from a, as a child and you spend basically as your job, you're meditating in an ashram with no other responsibilities, some people will get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, but even then they need talent. Because the most advanced meditators, not all of them will develop the cities. They may find it perfectly pleasant to do the meditation, but that does not necessarily mean they're going to develop the cities. In your book, what you do is you compare the lore of yoga with the empirical data of parapsychology, and you find many parallels. Right. So the, the purpose of Supernormal was to address the issue from a Western scientific mindset about the stories of the cities, mm -hmm. right? Can we believe these stories? Because there's lots and lots of stories written from every guru you've ever heard about. Mm -hmm. It is those powers that attract us because it's very difficult for a guru to say what enlightenment is actually like. What you find again and again is that the person will say it's ineffable. Mm -hmm. If it's ineffable, you can't have a good story about it, in which case you can't instruct other people about why this is something you'd want. Whereas if you can demonstrate that you can manifest a, a diamond out of nothing, well, that attracts attention. So, yeah. So the idea from a, a Westerner is, well, can we believe anything mm -hmm. about these cities at all, any of it? Yeah. From a scientific perspective, the answer would be probably not. Seems impossible for the same reason that a lot of psi seems impossible. Uh, so knowing something about the parapsychological literature and immediately seeing that there are parallels, then we can say, well, some of what Patanjali was writing about was not fantasy. 
he was writing from a mm-hmm. position where either he or people he've heard of or something uh, at the time told him that these are actual abilities that can be achieved. Whether his prescriptions for them or not are correct, we actually in most cases don't know. We don't know that gaining union with your friend will produce the equivalent of telepathy, although we can make a plausibility case that something like that happens. Mm. You have your friend in mind, and somehow you then know things. So I remember reading many years ago when, when Chuck Honerton was and others were developing the Gonsfeld method, <clears throat> that it specifically refers to the, the Yoga Sutras and the cities as an inspiration for developing that method. The idea of quieting the mind. Quieting the mind, quieting the environment, and with kind of withdrawing from the environment, which is very, very similar to the way that meditation is described. Mm-hmm. So what we can say then is from an experimental point of view that a, a way of mimicking to, to a small degree what somebody might experience as samadhi, which is in this case it's the Gansfeld, so it's a very pale uh, mimic, but nevertheless it designed after that idea can people demonstrate telepathy in that condition? The answer is yes. Mm-hmm. So maybe you don't need 40 years of meditation to achieve this unless you want to be able to do it at will. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be the big difference. The cities are not spontaneous things that occasionally happen. There's something that you can turn on and turn off. And most people, except for some very talented psychics, simply cannot do that. If you don't mind, I'd like to go back to uh, your statement that maybe in 40 years of meditation, you'd experience five minutes of samadhi. And and later you said, but it's ineffable. You can't describe it. Um, How would a person know whether or not they're in samadhi if it can't be described? Well, all I can say is from my own experience. Mm -hmm. So I have a sense of what it is like to have thoughts stop for a while. You you somehow just become awareness. And and after a while, you become aware of the fact that you haven't thought about anything for quite a while. Uh, In addition, there's, uh, at least for me, there's a sense of, I would say, calm or peace Mm -hmm. that is much, much more profound than, than what might be like a body calm. It's a, a mental or a, even awareness type of calmness that is unlike anything else that I've experienced in meditation or any other state. Hmm. Generally, I, I note that I notice it as it's as I'm leaving it, because in that state there are no thoughts, there's no action, there's nothing, except I know I'm awake. So it's in the process of leaving that state where I realize, holy smoke, that was different. Also, oftentimes, samadhi will be described as blissful. Well, that too. There's a sense of uh, a profound joy. It, but that's not quite the right word. It's something, and I understand why people use the word blissful. That's not quite right either. Because we associate those things with emotional body states. And it's not that. It's something else which has a mental correlate, I suppose. Hmm. Uh, The total amount of time that I mentioned is a couple of minutes. I don't actually know that that's the case. I know it wasn't hours because I know that the environment was pretty much the same, Hmm. but it it didn't feel like it was very long, Hmm. but it was a dramatically different condition. And I can say that if it were, if I was sufficiently motivated to try to get back there, because it is motivating to get into that state, uh, I can certainly understand then why uh, people involved in meditation, especially way back when, when maybe life was a lot more difficult, that if you can get into a state where you're saturated with some kind of, of joy that permeates everything, of course you'd want to go back there and, and stay there if you could. So enlightenment then, in one way of understanding it, at least as I understand it, is that you can you can go there at will and evoke some aspect of that even in daily life. Mm -hmm. So you always have a little piece of that underlying bliss, 
which is always present. And I can see then that that would be a very nice place to be. You know, my understanding of the history of yoga from uh, an earlier interview about it I did with Devashish Banerjee, who is a Sanskrit scholar, is it, it goes back to the uh, Indus Valley civilization, to the pre-Aryan cultures of India, where we see in some of their sculpture um, individuals seated in a like a lotus position, but they're also uh, pictured as the kings or the chieftains, the rulers of that society, and they're mm-hmm. they're shown surrounded by animals, suggesting that they have acquired shamanistic powers over the animals around them, and that's how they achieve political leadership in that culture. Uh, so the idea of pursuing enlightenment uh, I mean, came much later with the uh, uh, Upanishads and uh, the other uh, more philosophical philosophical writings that probably came thousands of years later. Yeah, well, it makes sense that it would have begun, the whole process would have begun with shamanism, since that seems to be the the primordial religion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is also possible that uh, these ancient pictures of people sitting in a lotus position uh, on a chair was always about royalty because there weren't any chairs back then. The only people who could sit higher than others were someone who was on a special platform that was built for them. And so like the throne in in medieval times, it was a a symbol of the person in charge. And the sitting in the lotus position, again, because maybe without chairs, people basically learned to sit that way. That was the easiest way to sit. Uh, Another interesting thing about yoga, as as I understand it, is that... um, There's the tantric tradition, which has had uh, more of a positive attitude toward the cities than uh, other branches of uh, yoga and Eastern spirituality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tantra uh, is a little bit more like Western magic. Mm -hmm. There are more rituals involved, there are ceremonies, there's chanting, there's more of a public display of of what's happening, and it's not anywhere near as aesthetic as people living in a cave for 30 years, right? Yeah. So uh, like like a, a, every other form of human activity that attracts people, there's going to be as many different types as there are people. Now, an, an interesting thing is that, as especially around, let's say, the early 19th uh, century, the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th, when Orientalism became very big, Western scholars started to look into the uh, Asian religions and and yoga became very popular. Uh, Many of the scholars had a scornful attitude towards these descriptions of the cities. You quote, for example, James Loiba, a psychiatrist who wrote about it in, in some of the most demeaning, hostile terms. Yeah, it was it was not popular early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was assumed that uh, these strange people from the east were primitive. Uh, what they're talking about was superstition, uh, but that's it's not that different than than we see today about the way that uh, ideas that don't match the scientific worldview are considered to be somewhere between silly and stupid and possibly dangerous. So we saw that early on as well. One of the consequences of all that was that research on the effects of meditation would only started really in about the 1960s. Mm-hmm. So if you, you look in the, the big uh, bibliographic databases on meditation research, uh, in the 60s there were maybe two or three, maybe a dozen at most, uh, most of them being produced by the people involved in transcendental meditation. Mm-hmm. We look now, uh, there are probably between four and 6,000 articles. In fact, as the co-editor-in-chief of a journal, Explore, I would say that probably every other paper that I get as a submission has to do with using mindfulness in lots of different contexts now. So mindfulness is a modern incantation of Vipassana, which is an ancient Buddhist form of meditation. And, of course, what we see now with with both systematic reviews and meta-analyses is that mental and physical health are improved. 
Mm-hmm. And more importantly, that it's now paid for by medical insurance as, as a treatment. So we've gone through uh, cultural times when this was exotic and crazy. Uh, and now it's paid for by insurance, which is as mainstream as you can get. I recall as an undergraduate college student uh, in around 1966, uh, the professor announced with great excitement a brand new discovery. Some yogis had been tested and it showed they could control their heartbeat. And up until then, researchers didn't think it was possible for human beings to control their own heartbeat. Right. So the, before biofeedback. Yeah. Right. So now we have people, as they talk about in Supernormal, like Wim Hof, the, the so-called Iceman. Mm. So this is a person who developed uh, Tumo meditation, which is the method that the Tibetans would use in order to uh, not, not be bothered by living up in the Himalayas where it was cold all the time. So... Uh, Wim, I believe, still holds the record for being submerged in ice water. So if you've ever been submerged in ice water, you know that if you do it for more than a couple of minutes, you'll probably be dead. Yeah. Well, but his, his record is about an hour and a half or maybe two hours now, which is, from a conventional perspective, this is impossible mm-hmm. because it would lower the, the core temperature to the point where the body couldn't sustain itself anymore. And yet he's demonstrated that it can be done. Yeah. So studies are now pushing even further beyond the idea of slowing the heart rate or controlling the heart rate into controlling very basic ideas about metabolism that were thought to be beyond the the ability to control, Mm -hmm. but apparently can be. And uh, I grew up in uh, Wisconsin where they had the polar bear club uh, every winter around New Year's Day. In fact, people would cut a hole in the ice and go uh, swimming in Lake Michigan. And uh, But they were in and out, uh, you know, in moments. <laughs> I don't think right. They- and immediately when and taken out, we covered with, with uh, lots of blankets, uh, coverings. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So as compared to Wim uh, Hoff, who ran a marathon above the Arctic Circle, just uh, even barefoot, wearing only uh, running shorts, which, for, again, for a normal person, they would die of frostbite. Uh, he was perfectly fine. I think he may have developed a blister. Well, there are many other feats like that, uh, such as uh, pain suppression and suppression of bleeding. And uh, Jack Schwartz, uh, who was able to insert needles in, into his body without any right. uh, trouble, uh, is well documented. So I, I guess it's fair to say in our lifetime, the scientific picture has changed dramatically. And yet there, there's a funny thing that goes on with parapsychology in particular, where we have have hundreds of experiments now and uh, large sections of the scientific and academic community behave as if uh, none of these experiments ever uh, occurred. Right. So we have uh, what's apropos here is that uh, for four years we had a, a research group on advanced meditation research. And then using meditation research now, which has become popular, to say, well, have have we gone as far as we can go? No, because the the goal of meditation was not to make you feel calm and help you physically. It was it was pushing in a comp- much further out than that. And yet, no one in the mainstream academic meditation research wants to touch it. So this working group brought together meditation teachers, advanced practitioners, and academics who know about the cities and know about what what happens when people start to meditate and said, well, this, first of all, we need to show that there is something to to look at and to create a research curriculum on what, what would we actually start to look at and can you look at it? So we're talking about uh, about transcendent states, about it, achieving enlightenment, achieving samadhi, achieving psychic abilities. We did a, a big survey of almost 2,000 meditators to simply ask them, which of these kinds of things have you experienced mm. as a result of your meditative practice? Well, many of them start reporting moments of transcendence, psychic abilities, the whole realm. So 
after four years of working on this, we wrote a paper, uh, and the paper was submitted uh, January of 2018 to PLOS One, which is a reasonably good journal. And in November, it finally was published. Hmm. So we have a, a, a published paper talking to the research community of people interested in meditation, saying, here's where the future of meditation research should go, and this is why. Hmm. The why is, you start meditating, you will start, just as Patanjali said, you will start bumping into these kinds of phenomena. And yes, the phenomena challenge our ideas about reality and all the rest, but it's happening. Hmm. So ultimately, this may provide a way or a, a, a road map for people who are already interested in meditation to be able to study both Psy and, and other things in a safe way, right? It's the, the reason why the, a lot of the kind of research that we're interested in is rejected is because it's not safe. It's not because the interest isn't there, because we know there is interest. But as an academic, you have to you have to take a narrow path that defines what it is that you do. Otherwise, you're not going to survive there very long. You mean it's not safe for your career? Yes, that's what I mean. It's <laughs> yeah. If you if you stray off of the narrow path of what is considered to be okay for your discipline then you may not remain in that discipline for very long. So yeah. the safety is about navigating the, the cultural constraints mm. within the academic world. It's not as if uh, there's really any particular harm from meditation. Well, we do talk in the paper about negative aspects of meditation. A small percentage of people who learn to meditate, or maybe only a couple of percent, uh, they'll become psychotic. Mm. Or, or they may have, they may previously have been on the edge, and this will push them. Yeah. So there, not everybody is going to have a wonderful experience with meditation, but if you think about it in terms of something like contraindications for any kind of treatment, every treatment has risk. The risk in this case is very low, but some people are not. It's not going to do very well for them. Hmm. So. Well, what do you do? You say, well, 95% of the people doing this will actually get a benefit. 5% won't. And actually, you know, pushing a person into a psychotic state is a rather severe uh, negative consequence, even if it's only uh, 1% or 2%. Right. And nevertheless, meditation teachers know that a small percentage of students are going to need significant help. So one of the reasons we raised that in this paper was to remind people that uh, both researchers and teachers need to be aware of when somebody is dropping into a bad place and then know how to help mm -hmm. them, too. Well, and I suppose you have to take into account that uh, in the population at large, uh, probably about 30% of uh, individuals are suffering from anxiety, depression, uh, uh, pre-psychotic conditions of uh, a wide variety. Right, right. And so some people are attracted to meditation, uh, maybe have higher depression or anxiety than the average population, mm -hmm. and they're looking for some kind of help. And some of them, as you said, are on the edge of psychosis anyway. And I suppose that's one of the reasons that it was so easy for people like James Loiba to criticize the whole yoga tradition because uh, uh, the natural assumption would be that these claims of miraculous powers are the result of some sort of uh, mental disturbance. <laughs> right. And there's still many people today who feel the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, one of the reasons why I decided to write this this book on supernormal is because the the taboo or the exotic nature of meditation and yoga have, is is pretty much melted away by now, and a lot of people are doing either practice one or the other are doing it in a very secular form. Like most yoga today is basically. Uh, a kind of combination of stretching and gymnastics. Mm -hmm. Some yoga teachers will teach about the meditative aspects as well, and maybe some about the history of it. But I think most people actually don't know what the consequences are, both historical consequences and what happens when you do a lot of practice. 
So I thought, okay, I can ride on this the rising surf of people who are doing meditation who may not actually know where they're headed. Yeah. Fortunately, most people would have pleasant experiences, but if they don't. We don't pass out the yoga sutras in every school now, so mm. people don't necessarily know that. Oh, by the way, you might start having precognitive dreams. That's simply part of what part of this practice. Uh, so that's what the book was was written for, basically. Mm-hmm. Now, back in the late nineteen seventies, you were a TM practitioner. Uh, they had a program that received a lot of publicity back in those years. They called it the TM Cities Program, and they claimed right. that thousands of meditators had learned how to levitate, or sometimes they called it just hopping. But they published pictures of people sitting in what looked like a full lotus posture, but they were up a foot or two in the air. And then that program, I mean, it fizzled out. Nothing really... Uh, came of it at all and I'm under the impression that they either decided that the publicity wasn't good uh, for them or maybe in their efforts to demonstrate actual levitation they realized uh, they weren't able to get that far well as far as the levitation goes the yogic flying no one has ever hovered the the description of what's supposed to happen with the yogic flying is that eventually you first start to hop and then you hover for short periods of time, and then you hover for long periods of time, and then you fly. Mm. But no one ever got past the hopping. I, I've seen demonstrations of uh, very adept yogic flyers, with flyers in quotes, and they were hopping mm. in, in strange ways, full lotus position and jumping up two feet. That's quite an athletic feat. Um, apparently without too much effort, because they were laughing while they're doing this and didn't appear to be out of breath. So I don't completely understand what was going on there. But a lot of the the city's effort transformed into what they call the Maharishi effect, Mm -hmm. which was the uh, radiation of goodness, one of the cities. And so the idea was there that if you got a a certain small percentage of the population doing city-type meditation – that it would it would radiate out peace, and so violence of any sort would start to decline. So that gave rise to many studies, forty or more studies, looking at the the role of group meditation in affecting the environment. Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of how the the yogic flying transformed into something else. <clears throat> I recall there were many studies published about the Maharishi effect, uh, primarily published uh, by the Maharishi International University in, in their own publications. And it, it had the, to me at least, the stigma of being what we call, or what I would call, agency-sponsored research, and an organization of, in essentially researching itself, which uh, from a sociological perspective uh, raises many questions. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, no one else wanted to do the research, yeah. right? We, we have pretty much the same problem within parapsychology, that there is a virtually, I was not going to say no, but very, very few psychologists or physicists who are interested in these topics will dare to do research on them. Because if they get something where they show there's no effect, they can publish it, probably, but then their colleagues will say, why did you even bother to do that? It's like a waste of time. Mm-hmm. If they get a positive effect, they may not publish at all because now they have to explain to their colleagues, why are you supporting those crazy people? So the same would be true for the early days of yoga and meditation when it, it wasn't quite academically safe to be able to do these studies. So who else is going to do them? Well, we don't know. Does interest continue about the, the role of meditation in, in reducing violence? Yes. I still haven't seen anybody who's been trying to replicate the, these early studies of, of the, uh, the TM people. And it should also be noted that many of the papers that came out of the Maharishi International University were published in very mainstream journals. So at least passing peer review yeah. on paper 
shows that they were doing quite a good job. It does seem that the emphasis on meditation these days has shifted away from transcendental meditation, which comes out of the Hindu tradition, and more into mindfulness meditation, which comes out of a Buddhist tradition. Right. And so this may just be a historical accident. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn came up with this secular form of Vipassana, uh, mindfulness meditation coming from a medical school it, it was seen to be uh, slightly more acceptable mm -hmm. so this often happens where you have some exotic thing that has certain tarnish to it and you secularize it uh, then people can can use it in very much the same way that uh, her Benson's relaxation response was a way of taking meditation and putting on a few new words to it and saying, oh, it's not really, it has nothing of that esoteric stuff to it. It's just, it's like what we understand. And now it was suddenly okay to study. Today, you must have hundreds of thousands of uh, yoga practitioners in the United States. Uh, here, where I live now in Albuquerque, I assume there are probably 30 or 40 yoga studios at least. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know when I was... Uh, a college student back in the 1960s, they were rare. They existed, but they were relatively rare. Right, and probably associated with hippies and psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, and it's true now that in uh, virtually every major and many minor cities, there's somebody somewhere is teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. Now, in some places, mainly in the, in the Deep South, there's still a lot of resistance to it because in, in, from a fundamentalist perspective, uh, usually, uh, yeah, most fundamental religions, not Hindu perhaps, uh, will view yoga as an infiltration of dastardly ideas from another religion. Mm -hmm. So, as I, I talk about in, in Supernormal, that there are, are people, oftentimes politicians who happen to be representing religious people, who will say that, uh, that stretching is non-Christian. And, and other statements that from my perspective is it's crazy. But nevertheless, it's influential in that it prevents programs, secular programs in meditation from showing up in schools. Mm. We know that meditation in schools helps the kids and the teachers, all of them, and yet there's resistance to it because of fear of the other, essentially. Yeah. I, I recall when I was very young in my 20s and kind of dissatisfied, I went to see a psychotherapist and he was asking me, what you know, what's your problem? And I said, well, I wish I had been born into a family of yogis. Why did I have to be born in, you know, the, into, in, into the Midwest in, in, uh, you know, a conventional family? My father ran a store and funny thing happened. My mother became a yoga teacher. <laughs> Yep. My mother taught yoga for 30 years, and actually it was well accepted. She uh, taught in the public school system in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for, for 30 years. Uh, wow. Uh, so it, <laughs> here I was complaining <laughs> that I hadn't come from a family of yogis, when in fact uh, it was actually going on. Yeah, I remember when I was a preteen that my mom was doing yoga. Mm. She wasn't teaching it, but she was doing it. And that's why we had all these books about yoga at home, uh, including ones about the uh, the ancient mystic masters of the East. And since I was a fan of science fiction, I was noticing the parallels between what these ancient yogis were supposed to be able to do and what was often portrayed in science fiction. Mm. And so in one case, you have supposedly a historical document, and the other one you have fantasy. Yeah, I was thinking, well, what's going on here? Is this real or not real? That was one of the original reasons why I got interested in parapsychology, because now there was a way of testing. Without just looking at the stories, you could test these ideas, and that's mm. what caught my attention. As far as I know, and maybe you could comment, uh, there's nothing in the science of parapsychology, uh, all that we've accumulated so far, to rule out any of the claims of uh, the yogis, even if they haven't been validated, uh, like uh, levitation or some of the more extreme claims. Uh, they might well be true. 
Right. We can't exclude any of the cities. And in fact, if anything, we can say that the elementary cities, which are essentially what parapsychology can study, mm -hmm. clairvoyance and precognition and so on, uh, we're, we have high confidence that that is true. So it would be very strange then that if potentially was writing about a series of 26 or so different kinds of cities, that the first couple of them would be true, as best as we can tell empirically, and all the rest of them were made up. It doesn't make any sense. So it, it, we can then see it in a slightly different context. And if you go back 2,000 years and we didn't all have distractions based on cell phones and entertainment and hardly anything else that we would consider modern, then there could be people and were people, and even today in some ashrams, who spend all of their waking hours learning to meditate and becoming more and more and more adept at it and going into mental states that start to blur the difference between mind and matter mm -hmm. to a very significant degree. And from that perspective then that the what Patanjali is writing about were probably things that were well understood at his time as things that were quite real. And so that's why he wrote it in a very matter-of-fact way. Yeah, and Patanjali wrote this, uh, what, around the 8th century? I, I forget exactly. It, the various uh, estimates of when it was written, but most people think around 2,000 years ago. Okay. So what that suggests is that in, in ancient times uh, in Asia, and maybe to some degree as well in the West, uh, there was a method of inquiry a, a discipline that involved meditation, involved yoga postures, involved uh, philosophy, and uh, it was capable of uncovering things that we are today rediscovering using the scientific method. But th they had a methodology that worked equally well, if not better, for them, and it seems to some degree to have been lost in our culture. Right. So one of the critiques I hear about people who are paying too much attention to the Vedas, even, or the Upanishads, they'll say that, yeah, that maybe those gurus were onto something, but they didn't develop the iPhone. Mm -hmm. In other words, their, their mastery over the physical world was not very adept. And so this is, of course, the modern bias where we can say, well, if you can't create an iPhone, you don't know anything, mm -hmm. which, is, which is nonsense. Because it, it is basically ignoring this whole other realm of reality. In fact, the, as I talk about in Real Magic, the only thing we can ever know is our awareness, which is more like an idealistic philosophy. So we're paying a huge amount of attention today on external things that we can look at and touch and measure and not paying attention to the thing which is doing that. Mm -hmm. It's the attention, the awareness that is being able to do this observation. Whereas in, in these ancient times, they didn't have the same kind of instrumentation. They used a different kind of instrumentation, which is like in there somewhere, and developed other ways of, of being. We also have a certain romanticism about that, because in, in ancient times, there were, first of all, far fewer people, but the number of people who had the luxury of being able to meditate 14 hours a day was very, very small. Right. Most people didn't have that luxury. So like as in today's time, uh, scientists who can spend all of their time studying the nature of reality, that's also a luxury. Right. I can't do what I do if, if somehow people are not delivering food to the grocery store. So it is a luxury to explore the nature of reality uh, in both in ancient times and today. And it's not too surprising, given the, this huge cultural gulf between then and now, that we've come up with quite different ways of not only perceiving what reality is, but understanding who and what we are. I believe you are part of a community of uh, scientists and uh, scholars today who are uh, pushing for what is, is being called post-materialist science. Yes. And, and in a, in a way, what it seems as if you're trying to recover a, a metaphysical or ontological understanding that, that was well understood by the ancient yogis and Buddhists. Yeah, except I don't actually like the word post-materialism, hmm. that phrase, because it's a promissory note without having any idea about what that is. Uh -huh. 
The other thing is that uh, post-materialism sounds like anti-materialism. It can be perceived that way, and that's not what it is at all. Like as a scientist, you'd say, well, you can't throw away materialism. It works too well. And that's true. We don't, I don't want to throw away materialism. I rely on it just as much as everybody else does as a, as a way of thinking. So I'm thinking more in terms of how do we expand the scope of what we currently think of as everything, right? You go through university and you think, well, materialism explains everything. Well, maybe not. And that's where we start now to look look more seriously at these ancient ideas that part of the esoteric traditions that I think have been prematurely dismissed. Mm -hmm. And so it's a it's a challenge. How do we bring that into the current worldview and expand it so that we're not going to accidentally destroy ourselves? If you're uncomfortable with the designation of post materialist, do you have uh, a different one that you prefer? I don't. I don't know what to call it. And so it, it's something about making our worldview more comprehensive. But that's take too many syllables to say that. So, <laughs> so I don't know what, what term is best to use. Well, maybe this is a good note to end on. Uh, uh, ambiguity and the admission that there's something important out there that we don't yet have a good label for. Right. And, and one that is particularly interesting because it's, it's pointing directly at philosophical assumptions mm -hmm. in science and society and culture and everything else. And it's not easy thinking about philosophical assumptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you need professional philosophers to be able to do that without having their heads explode. Whereas for mo most people, I found even in myself, I have not studied that much philosophy. But I find that the, the longer I have spent studying almost any topic that if you don't start looking at the underlying assumptions, you can get caught into into very narrow ways of thinking about the nature of reality. And that immediately starts to excluding aspects which are almost certainly there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so post-materialism or whatever we're going to call it, I think we need to go there. Uh, and we need to figure out how to get there, too, and make it safe for academics and others to study. Well, I, th I think safety is, uh, professional safety is really important right now because uh, th there's just such a huge stigma uh, th that faces people. You've been fortunate. You've had a career in parapsychology now going back many, many decades, but uh, that's extraordinarily rare. Yeah, and, and I'm very aware of, of the, the luxury that I've had. Uh, it hasn't stopped people, of course, from, from attacking this kind of work and sometimes attacking me as a result, but I recognize it's par for the course. Uh, the older I get, the more interested I am in breaking the taboo to allow all of the people who I know would like to do research in this area to allow them to do it. Mm -hmm. Because the stigma also prevents funding, yeah. and without funding, very little is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So part of the, the urge for a post-materialist science is to it is actually directly attacking this idea of a taboo. Mm -hmm. right? You break a taboo by suddenly showing everybody that the emperor has new clothes and having everyone admit that. And then the taboo was broken. Mm -hmm. Well, Dean Radin, uh, it's been a real pleasure to have this time with you. Thank you so much for being with me. You're welcome. And I uh, look forward to future opportunities. Me too.